Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, my name's Matthew Higgs. Um, it's Billy Childish. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'd like to um, just briefly uh, acknowledge Richard Burke, who I co-curated the exhibition at the ICA with. And uh, the ICA exhibition runs in parallel to a show of Billy's recent paintings that's currently up at White Columns in New York, uh, an alternative space that I've been the director of for the last five years. I'd also like to acknowledge Mark Sladen, who's in the room tonight, who is a former uh, director of exhibitions at the ICA, whose idea it was to do a show with Billy at the ICA. And uh, it's great to see you again, Mark, so thanks. Um, tonight's conversation, uh, you know, hopefully will go where it goes. And uh, uh, before we start, um, I've asked Billy if uh, he'll sing a song. Yeah, Matt asked me if I'd do... Don't worry about it. The sound man's looking really nervous now. <laughs> um, yeah, Matt asked me if I'd say, asked me the other day if I'd sing a couple of songs. To, I think it's to sort of like, um, what's the reason? Break the ice. To break the ice. <laughs> I, could, I did learn actually to do a little tap dance when I worked in the dockyard, but it's only walking tap dance, and it's so like I said, I think it says more about how unemployed we were in the dockyard than. I won't do that anyway. It's not much, it's sort of like just, I can do it as I walk across the room. It's, anyway. I was just thinking for breaking the ice, my tap dance song. Right. This is called The Bitter Cup. It's a um, song I did with the singing loins, and it's, uh, it, this was written about 92, it says. It's about um, drinking, and I think in 92, 93 is when I gave up alcohol, so it's probably um, the reason for writing, some sort of celebration of that. And I remember the breath of my father, his kisses were bearded and damp. The romance of the bottle dragging him down to awaken dishevelled in the tank. And there's no sea deeper than the piss of the bottle And none speaks the truth like the drunk Whiskey runs through me like a sorrowful river I'm down on my knees and I'm sunk And I remember my mother hitting the gin She fell and we thought she was dead Naked and doll-like his skull face was shouting We ran to our room painted red and there's no sea deeper than the piss of the bottle And none speaks the truth like the drunk Whiskey runs through me like a sorrowful river I'm down on my knees and I'm sunk Hot for women, we curse and abuse them They say we ain't got no respect Full of bravado, godless and fearful We pray no one will detect and there's no sea deeper than the piss of the bottle And none speaks the truth like the drunk Whiskey runs through me like a sorrowful river I'm down on my knees and I'm sunk And there's no taste sweeter than the rush of hot vomit Sit through decaying back teeth I'd whisper I love you and quit all this hating But in truth I ain't got the belief and there's no sea deeper than the piss of the bottle And none speaks the truth like the drunk Whiskey runs through me like a sorrowful river I'm down on my knees and I'm sunk Smashed and dishevelled, of course they did wreck us Poisoned by our own bitter cup Stumbling and hoping inside I was lonely I'm sick and I'm down and I'm drunk And no see deeper than the piss of the bottle And none speaks the truth like the drunk Whiskey runs through me like a sorrowful river I'm down on my knees and I'm sunk Um, 
uh, on that cheerful note, uh, well, it's still like, I don't we'll know, begin. It's something cheerful about it because it the it's a end, celebration the end, of ending something. The end of something. Yeah. Um, the reason I asked Billy if he was uh, you know, willing to sing some uh, unaccompanied songs throughout tonight's proceedings is uh, one of the best ever uh, shows I saw Billy play was at the Water Rats in King's Cross. I'm not sure if it's even still there. But it was uh, you and Beck uh, singing unaccompanied together. And, oh, uh, wow, yeah. Very memorable evening for all kinds of reasons. Um, okay. Um, this uh, lunchtime at the ICA, uh, I had lunch with John Stezica. Oh, uh, John, yeah. He says hello and tells you that he loves your show. Oh, thank you. Tony. And um, John Stezica, a British artist, I'm sure you're familiar with his work, um, was teaching at St. Martin's School of Art in the late 1970s and early 1980s uh, when Billy attended art school for about a year and a half. And um, over lunch, uh, John told me that Billy was the most unteachable student he'd ever encountered in all of his 30 years of teaching. And uh, I think he meant it as a compliment. Um, he also told me that he used to send in uh, or hand in uh, poorly written dyslexic essays, uh, and he thought you were taunting him to fail you, uh, which he told me he never did. So I would just thought maybe an interesting... They were, they were poems. But, well, there you go. <laughs> I uh, never wrote an essay, my God. <laughs> but, uh, you know, perhaps we just start at the beginning, and, uh, you know, with your time at art school, um, I know that you've addressed it in your own writing, and it's been addressed tangentially in interviews and in the interview that me and Richard did in Roland, but um, I asked uh, Peter Doig. Peter Doig, the artist, was also at St. Martin's School of Art at exactly the same time as Billy, and was also taught uh, or encountered John Stezica there too. But I asked Peter about your time together there, and uh, he said that he has no memory whatsoever of you making any work in the studios. That's correct. And um, I'm glad that that's uh, backed up. <laughs> But you know, maybe you can. Um, you know, you, you you talk to this in the but in the ICA thing. But um, you know, my thought is that you know, it seems in one way or another that your disappointment or frustration with your experience or expectations of art school, mm -hmm. in many ways, that disappointment or frustration seems to have shaped your subsequent identity as an artist. Do you think that's a fair comment? And perhaps you can elaborate a little more about how and why you ended up at art school, if it became somewhere to ultimately move away from? Yeah, it's a difficult one, that. Um, I wanted to be a painter from when I was about 10. And I wanted to, and I heard about art school, and I wanted to go to one. And I didn't want to go to a regular school at all. But I went through secondary education, finished at 16, undiagnosed dyslexic with no qualifications and applied to go to an art school and was re um, not allowed to show my work to them. And um, I ended up working as a stonemason in the dockyard um, where I did a lot of drawing. And I'd, my elder brother was actually studying at Slate. And um, I used to stay in Chalk Farm in a squat with my brother when I was on block release for building college in South London in, the, in 76. So I used to go into the Slade and I'd know, I knew about St Martin's and I went into St Martin's one day with my drawings and got accepted onto their foundation course. Although I wasn't allowed to apply to my local art school, they wouldn't let me show the work. So I... Um, is that okay? Now, so then... Uh, um, I wasn't, I wasn't allowed a grant to, to go to a London art school because I'm from Chatham in Kent. And I was forced to go to a Midway art school. And this was for the year 77. And I was put on probation when I went to this school in the first two weeks. And um, I wasn't deemed to have finished or completed the course at the end of, um, at the end of that year. So I couldn't apply to do a painting course, which I wanted to, but I applied independently again to St. Martin's, and I got into, into, onto the BA painting at St. Martin's for 78. I, I attended, living in a, I was living in another um, housing association behind King's Cross, uh, which I noticed they've destroyed today. 
um, and uh, studied at St. Martin's for the first term of 78 in the September. And they were doing great bit. I had escaped secondary education, escaped the dockyard, and I thought I was going to meet a community of artists who loved painting. And, of course, I met people who were quite cool and uh, uh, reserved and doing uh, very large abstract expressionist paintings, which were all the rage at that time. And uh, I was really interested in either Dada or figurative painting. These are the two things that I did. And Dada wasn't in, and figurative painting wasn't in. So I left after a quarter of a term. And I was very, very disappointed with my art school experience all round. The only thing that I got from it was meeting some musicians in Medway and playing in punk rock groups and realising that art school wasn't for me. And the only reason I reapplied to St Martin's in 1980 and attended for a year and a, year and a half was because Thatcher was um, having a crackdown on dull Q scum and I've got no qualifications, so I went and hid in an art school again. And I painted at home all the, all the way through this period. So I don't really know what the influence the art school would have had on my work. Um, it's not in reaction to it, it's despite it. So um, I'm, not, I'm not uncritical of art education, but it doesn't form how I work. I'm one of these people who can't pitch anything and I can only do what I do. So I would not be... Um, I'm actually not reactive. I'm very opinionated and I will say what I disagree with and what I think are the problems, but it won't actually really change the way that I do something. So I don't think art schools had really any effect on my painting whatsoever. Maybe it had a slight influence on my music. But was that... Um you know, decision to leave art school and set yourself up somewhat autonomously in Chatham. I mean, it seems like that's the beginning of a subsequent lifetime of decisions to work independently no, it's outside a, of the music business, outside of the literary no, it's, world. No, it, it, it appears that way, but I'm actually, I, I'm actually what I'm like. I'm, if you meet people who knew me when, like when Peter says, you know, what I was like at, at the art school, not painting within the art school... I was, um, I've always been of this character since I was young. If you meet people who knew me when I was five, they say that I'm not particularly different. So I would be doing that anyway. The thing that made me want to do my own thing was the idea that it wasn't a job and it was your own way of being. And that's all I ever wanted. And that's what I took to music and to writing. And I thought that everybody else would be like me. And when I and St Martin's the second time I was expelled after uh, in the in the second term, and I would have hung on there for the for the meagre little grant I was getting because it was just going to go up because my father had gone into prison, and that would have been sort of like worth having. I saw it completely as a um, I'm a I'm a malingerer who sort of like paints at home, and that's what I did at art school, and that's what I do without school. And I applied to art school lots of times during the um, 80s. I got accepted for interview at Glasgow, but I couldn't be bothered to get on the train. And I um, applied to Maidstone when Tracy was studying there because they had the press and I wanted to use the things there. But once you've been expelled from an art school, they don't really want to entertain having, having you back in their midst. They, sit, they saw me as trouble. Um, John, uh, tell me... He had strong memories of attending the Billy Childish meeting at St. Martin's, which I guess was the one that led to your expulsion. And uh, he told me at that meeting he volunteered to independently tutor, mentor you if they'd let you stay in the school. Yeah, he, um, told, he told me that as well. Which I guess it didn't happen. Um, you just let slip that when you were expelled from St. Martin's, you know, you just casually said that's when your father went to prison. Uh, if anybody's read your autobiographical novels, My Fault and Notebooks of a Naked Youth, they'll know that, you know, in these autobiographical works, uh, you've discussed your family life in, you know, often graphic detail. Um, but I think it's not generally acknowledged that you actually come from a very artistic family. You alluded to it a minute ago that your brother, older brother was at the Slade. 
Uh, your mother remains a very gifted ceramicist. I think your father made art too? My father's still painting, yeah. yeah. Your father's still alive and still making work. But, you know, in some respects, this idea that you come from, you know, by most people's standards, I would think of it somewhat bohemian family background, might be something of a surprise because I think there's a perception, and, you know, maybe I'm generalizing, that somehow you're a, you emerged fully formed and independent of these kind of influences. But I was just curious about you as a teenager growing up in a, a household where art clearly had you know, more than a presence. It was something that was, uh, and in fact, it's the thing that connects you, your father, your mother, and your brother. Well, my mother wasn't making pots at that time. My mother started making pots uh, 10 years or so later, but she was probably the most um, liberal. My, I was talking to my nephew this evening because my father was sort of like quite an arch conservative, but I said he was used, used this conservatism as a means of, of a tool to uh, get what he wanted out of life. Actually, he's just criminal. Um, maybe those two things do go hand in hand. Um, but the big influence would have been my elder brother. Uh, my father had already left home when we were quite young, and there were a lot of painting materials around, and there were lots of art books. And it was um, all I could do. I, I couldn't read and write, and all I could do was draw. And I did that at school and did very well at drawing. And I was considered, you know, people openly acknowledged I was uh, uh, gifted at drawing. Um, my brother really was very ambitious as an artist, and he, I had to model for him all the time during when I was um, from about nine through to about 15. So my brother got into art school on lots of drawings of me. And he's very violent and aggressive, making me model for him. And I had this... Um, I really sort of like think I emulated my older brother in many ways, in his taste in music and in uh, art. So it became a real thing just to... It was a real thing just to paint. So I always painted. So I did my first oil paints with my dad's... Oh, I was when I was about 11. And I'd done quite a lot of painting. And I'd generally be copying my brother. And so my brother would bring hand at home Andy Warhol books, so I'd make lots of Jimi Hendrix Andy Warhols with little stamps. And I would go to... I was into military stuff as well. I'd go to London, buy old medals, go to the Tate. This is from about 11 or 12, 13. And I sort of like had different periods of what I was really into. And by the... Um, by the time I was 15, I was really, really inter interested in fauvism and did lots of fauvist paintings. And then um, uh, 16 or 17, I was really interested in Dada, which came around with a punk rock and making fanzines. And I was, uh, I really liked the subversiveness of the Dadaists, and I used that to help me get um, put on probation, on foundation, because of my. Uh, I, I did a lot of um, uh, con contentious constructions. I did uh, three paintings. There's green fuck off, blue fuck off, and yellow fuck off with big sign, big paintings with fuck off written on them. And this, this was a really provincial art school, and you could really get told off this in the sex mobile with hardcore pornography and used Durex, which was for the um, bridal suite <laughs> project. <laughs> No, I found some of this stuff the other day. And it was hilarious because the tutors were really upset about it. It was great. I was, and in the meantime, I was still doing my little portraits and painting. But I wouldn't do anything that they asked me to. I would always sort of like do it the way I wanted. But my mother will tell you that that is what I was like from age dot. You know, that's just my character. Infuriated all of my family and infuriates lots of friends, and infuriates lots of relationships I have. But it's not sort of like... And people think it's some sort of great effort I make, but unfortunately, it's the way God made me. It's like this thing of doing a lot of work. I don't actually try to do anything. It's just just how I use. Do you ever make any effort to change? I make an effort to not be... Um, because I'm very sort of uh, sensitive, and I like people to like me, and I don't like them disliking me. So I sort of like try to, um, you know, over the years, I've tried to be a little bit less lumpy. You know, so I don't like... Well, you know how sort of sweet I am and affectionate <laughs> to everyone. And, but it's sort of like... 
it sort of sometimes gets in the way this sort of thing that I have opinions because people presume that because I've got opinions I must be really angry about something. Whereas really, yeah, I suppose I am about the doorknob or something. But um, I only met you in '93, uh, I think, and um, it, you know, as you just mentioned before, you'd, you'd stopped drinking hmm. by the time I met you. So I mean, I'm, I'm guessing um, that you were probably quite a different person in the preceding. 15 odd years. I could be, yeah. I could be sometimes, but I was so like, one of the reasons I could give up drunk, drinking is because I never ever blacked out when I drank. So um, I could never say, did I do that? I'd always know exactly what I'd done. So I've always had this, uh, which I think means why waste your time drinking if you can't even experience oblivion. So um, I, was, I could be a little bit more colourful when I was drunk. I'm not sure if it, it's probably hormones as well because I was younger. Um, you, you're thinking about you know the nature of your work in the 80s, uh, especially in your writing, but also in the paintings from that time, which have been rarely seen. Um, you know the work is explicitly autobiographical, and um, you know this connection to the family, to your family history, to your own relationship and negotiation with those histories persists and. Um, but I think especially in relation to the exhibition downstairs of uh, recent paintings and the, the show in New York of uh, new paintings, um, you paint, I think, almost exclusively in a bedroom at your mother's house in Whistable, and I think you still only paint on Sundays. Is that true? That's uh, broadly true. I mean, this week I painted three days which weren't Sundays, but that is sort of like I had special permission. <laughs> So, I mean, you're literally a Sunday painter, which, you know, I think mm. is clearly, you know, part of the, the, the mythos around you as an artist. But um, Well, can I just interject? I'll yeah. tell you, it's really handy because I, I painted about eight paintings this week and I can't afford to paint more than on one day. There's not enough room to store paintings. And my brain is absolutely boiled because I sort of like, uh, I painted on Sunday two or three. I painted two or, on Monday and two on Tuesday. And these are sort of like, some of these are large six-foot canvases. And then today I had to draw up an eight-foot one down at Steve's, and I've got to paint that tomorrow. And I'm beginning to sort of like realise why I paint on a Sunday. It's because you sort of like, it gives you time for something else to go on in the mind. If I sort of like uh, let myself, if I was in a situation where I had the canvases and the paint and the studio, I'd probably, <laughs> probably paint myself to death in a in a couple of months, because I I'm, really am um, a little bit frazzled. But in, you know, in the way that you compartmentalise you know, the painting, the way that you set up a you know, structure and this rhythm and this place that you make the paintings still at your mother's house, mm. I mean, do you have a similar disciplined approach to writing and no, making I'm, music? No, I've no discipline in any of those things. I barely have discipline in painting. What happened was, in the eight, up until the 80s, I used to paint sort of like two, maybe 200 paintings, 150, 200 paintings a year during the summer because I could make all the boards up outside and then I'd just paint for two months and then not paint the rest of the year. And I decided I needed to have, for some reason, I felt I needed to have this sort of like regularity with the painting and not be doing it that way. And once I left St Martin's, <laughs> I started painting almost immediately once a week. And I needed to be going to work, so I didn't want to be paint where I lived. I wanted to be going to do something, so I had the studio at my mother's house, and I went to my mother's house, and that's where I go to work. And not seeing the work for a week is really, really, really advantageous. I've got this camera, and um, this has caused me all sorts of trouble. I got a digital camera two months ago. And it's so I can record the work, so the little gallery I work with, so we uh, can see what I've been up to, and I know what's going on, I can send some stuff to Matt. And it seems like a great idea, but then I get home and I can see what I've done. And then I sort of like, invariably get in the car and drive 25 miles next day to change a brush mark. Which will, and you know, if you, this is the other crazy thing. You see, these paintings downstairs are actually quite formal and easy. Some of my stuff's really difficult, and you can't imagine that there'll be... Um, any need to change one brush mark on them. But in my mind, I see one thing that has to change and I have to do it, and you do, it's a complete mess. But if I'm now, if I'm doing that, you know, I'm going to go mad. So, some way, you've got to keep this distance. 
you've got to be out, get out of the way of the painting and not be involved in the painting so that, well, I've got to, so that I can uh, engage fully with it properly at the time when it's happening. And can you create a similar distance with the music? The music is something that I do when I fancy. Like, I wrote several songs yesterday with a friend of mine, uh, Vermin Poets. We sort of like, I think we wrote eight songs yesterday, <laughs> but we did that via the um, internet with lyrics and phoning each other. But that, that's exactly how my songs happen. If I need to write an album or I get the urge, I'll write it over a couple of weeks. And that's how I write novels as well. So, and the novels are the hardest. You know, like uh, the other, I've been writing one about called The Stonemason. And a couple of weeks ago, I was in the mood and I could do 15 hours a day working on it. But then we've got a new baby and if my... Um, concentration gets broken with that stuff, I just drop it. And the only time I'll start working on that novel again is when the, uh, when the urge takes me. I have no discipline. I, you, I think you just turned 50, right? Hmm. Um, I mean, whilst you've been producing all of this stuff, you know, the thousands of paintings, the hundreds of albums, and the many hundreds of songs, and, you know, the 50 plus books of poetry, prose, writing, and so on. And a, a thousand collages, at least. And a thousand collages, at Which least. Which no one knows about at all, all my dada. So. And the eight new songs from yesterday. I mean, are you aware of, uh, you know, the, the, the scale of the production? I mean, does, or does that just move behind you and you keep moving forward? Yeah, we always, me and Sexton always called it our ship, what we did. And I think probably a lot of people understand that idea. It's sort of like it's something that you munch through and goes behind you and you're into the next thing. The only thing that really excites me about painting is not galleries, not exhibitions, not, uh, is, is doing it. That's what I like. I like doing, th doing a painting. You know? So for me, it's exactly the same as when I was a kid with a lolly stick and mud in the gutter. It's sort of like, it draws me in, I want to play with it, and that, it relaxes my soul. I was talking, you remember Janine uh -huh. in New York, a friend of mine who lives there, and she's a Swiss painter, and she, or artist, and she was in, um, I was out in Zurich with her in, in about, 90, about 1990, and she had a studio, and she gave me a couple of canvases to paint, and um, she was getting, I was painting some sort of medieval-influenced uh, work of me and her with me holding a skull. It's based on someone's portrait with his wife. And I was sitting there whistling away, enjoying happy as Larry, and she caught her canvas alight and threw it out the window into the snow and came back in and was all angry and angsty. She said, how can you just sit there and whistle painting that sort of evil, dark painting? And I said, well, because I enjoy it. Um, maybe that's a, a good point for another song. All right. Well, we got, these are all a bit bleak, the songs. That's good. Good. I've got this one which is called Thatcher's Children, and it's a punk rock song, but I did do a... Um, I wrote a, uh, a folk version of it for a friend of mine who um, is sort of like a, a folk musician, so it's handy. And uh, he's, he's been cited as the new Woody Guthrie, but it was interested that, uh, interesting that they said that his people said that this was too political for him to do. That says more about their idea of what Woody Guthrie is than the song. I'm going to give it a go. I don't know how the melody will go. It's going to be a bit more spoken word, I think. It goes, Thatcher's children have inherited the earth. Ronald Reagan was there. He gave the curse. Thatcher's children... What can you do when every little smile has to shine brand new? Thatcher's children, they came from afar. Now even rock and roll is just flogging a car. Thatcher's children holding tight to the purse. It ain't getting better, it's just getting worse. A mobile is ringing, the ice is getting thin. A terrorist might get you, the tunnel's caving in. The countdown's beginning, the winner can't win. Save your own skin. Thatcher's children, you said it's punk rock. Now we're all on our knees and we're all sucking cock. Thatcher's children who believe it's true. 
What you did to them, they'll do it to you. Thatcher's children, the headlines will grab you. Don't go out your homes or your children might stab you. Thatcher's children, you said it'd be fun. Now you're staring down the barrel of your own gun. A mobile is ringing, the ice is getting thin. A terrorist might get you, the tunnel's caving in. The countdown's beginning, the winner can't win. Save your own skin. Thatcher's children, what can you lose when you can all be famous on YouTube? Thatcher's children gave the communist fist, but your seductive charms they just couldn't resist. Thatcher's children, aren't you glad she came, preaching her gospel of greed and gain? Thatcher's children, won't you give me a smile for the CCTV cameras that follow you mile after mile? A mobile is ringing, the ice is getting thin. A terrorist might get you, the tunnel's caving in. The countdown's beginning, the winner can't win. Save your own skin. Actually, I should... I did this as I, um, I just, it's not sure no one's interested, but I'll tell you. Um, this was written, a fella from Faber and Faber rang me up and he said, Oi, we're doing a, um, a book with people doing. Did you really say Oi? Yeah, he said, Oi, you slag. <laughs> we're, doing, we're doing a book on um, people redoing lyrics, re redoing lyrics of um, famous songs. And they got some sort of the old poet to uh, edit it and I'm very obedient someone says to me oh we're doing this will you do it I say sure okay sir so I sent it straight off I think I was the only person who sent one in I think they scrapped the idea and this is actually to um, I wrote this to London Calling oh I see so writing lyrics for existing music yeah so this New actually lyrics. yeah but Joe's gone and pegged it so he, he won't be able to do it for me um, so I just wanted to, um, you know, just I, you know, it's something I've been aware of and interested in since I got interested in your work in the late '80s. But um, is you know, is the reception of your art not so much the reception of your music? Because I think you know, by the end of the '80s, you were pretty much established as a you know substantial figure in the independent underground music worlds of various kinds. In that corner over there. Um, you know, you were you know, you were a cult figure by anyone's definition of that idea. You know, certainly your influence on the early music scenes in Seattle is pretty well established and discussed and so on. But you know, I was more interested in the, the reception of your art and um, you know, I think in um, nineteen ninety uh, you appeared on the front cover of Art Scribe magazine, which at the time was the default, you know, most interesting art magazine published in this country. And it was a cover story written by a very interesting German artist and writer called Jutta Kurta, who was very, very involved with the Cologne art and music scene. She was a writer for Specs magazine, too. And, uh, you know, I think, even to me, it was, it was something of a surprise to see you there, because there'd been kind of no lead in establishing a, a context for Billy Childish. Um, if you think about that time in Britain, 1990, Two years previously was the Freeze exhibition. It was the very nascent early days of uh, British arts, kind of you know a renaissance of one kind or another. You know how you interpret that. But I was surprised to see you there, and um, you know I think a couple of years later in Cologne, your work was shown alongside that of Mike Kelly, Raymond Pettibon, and Jim Shaw. And certainly that conversation, that dialogue for your art, simply didn't exist here. And um, you know, so clearly there was a very receptive audience, not just for your music, which I think in the 90s, 80s, sorry, you'd been very successful in German-speaking countries. But there was also a very receptive audience for your art. And, um, you know, how, how would you characterize, you know, the difference in the reception of your art around that time in the late 80s and early 90s, so certainly between mainland Europe and here, because it seems, just looking at it from a distance, that it was quite different. Yeah, well, I don't, the art scribe thing, I don't know how that came about. I didn't really take any notice of it. Um, and I, I never followed art magazines, so I didn't know, I didn't understand its significance. <laughs> and um, as far as Germany went, I used to go, we've been playing in Germany since the late 70s. 
and um, we carried on playing through, through the 80s. They found out that I painted some people and they asked if I'd shown my paintings, which I did. And the, um, the thing that I've noticed when I did shows in Germany and France and Spain was that mainstream uh, broadsheets would come along and look at the work and talk about it, and when I a novel published in Germany as well, um, on the basis of what I did, not on the basis of whether I had permission to do it. <laughs> and I think that England is uh, a little bit conservative in these areas. It's like, uh, or shall we say, a little bit more fashion conscious. So if you're out of step with things in England, it's sort of like, well... I, you, you talk about this success the music had, but we were always viewed very dubiously as well. I mean, we were reviewed during the eighties on the basis that we, not that we were a good rock and roll group, but that we were obviously trying to sound like Wham, but didn't quite know how. And in England, I would, in England yeah. And I think the same thing. I mean, we sometimes in Germany. I remember someone coming up to say, "The audience would like you if you used the big boxes," because we use very old, small amplifiers. So if we were allowed and had big boxes, we'd be a better group. So even in Germany, you encountered these things. And, uh, but Germany was a lot more responsive. But the, um, the, the English thing is really, always seems to me is, is it okay for this person to do that? And does it show that I'm stupid if I like it? Or does it show if I'm intelligent if I like it? And my stuff is quite awkward, lumpy and emotive and not very English and much more European anyway. I mean, I remember when I was mates with Pete at St. Martin's and that's how I got to know um, Matt because Pete wanted to do an exhibition of my paintings uh, in Cubic Gallery in the early 90s and Matt came along and I remember Pete telling me, I'm not sure, I think Matt as well, that people were saying to him, do you really like that rubbish? And they had to sort of... They were the only, you know, it's embarrassingly, embarrassingly sort of own up to thinking that what I did had any value whatsoever. But I think that's because England's very, very small. Very, I mean, you know, you, you're, you're in New York. I mean, England thinks it's real, you know, real fancy and the biggest thing going. I always, I'd much rather get them in Germany as more of them. Um. You know, I, I, you know, distinctly remember we didn't get thanked for doing the show with you in '94. So I mean, the, the show, oh, anyone? Oh, you did the, by me. I gave you a wood cut, and I did one for Pete. Well, as well, I didn't mean that. I meant, <laughs> I meant the, the show came and went, and then we, yeah. we did another one in '95 of, of your drawings at Cubert, and that and came that was and went quite, too. That, that should have been right because that was all love letters with little <laughs> drawings on, and you'd think that would be sort of like that was not obvious. You know, that would sort of like be a bit arty. That you think they go for that. But I think by that time, you know, 94, 95, you know, the, the problems in the, the newly emergent British art world had, had begun and the sort of tabloidies around contemporary art in Britain had begun, which, of oh, course, yeah. is amplified into a, like a constant noise now. Yeah. But the problems were already evident then, I think, and it was clear that your work at that point was out of step with whatever was of interest in this country at that time. But I think it's also true that... It, Peter's, Peter Doig's work was too. I mean, this is before Peter Doig showed with Victoria Miro Gallery. It's before the paintings started to sell. Mm. It's before anything had been written about his work. And, you know, you're clearly a very different artist, but I think your points of origin at St. Martin seem somewhat similar, that you were both out of step in 1980. And by the time the next decade had come around, you're still both out of step with whatever the interests might have been. Well, well Pete was sort of like, say, would say, you know, like, I remember talking to him in the 90s about um, students' expectation. I was teaching at the Royal College at the same time as Pete for a little while. I went in for a, do some le a visiting lecture in Anna at Chelsea. And we were chatting about what it was like meeting the students. And the really strange thing, we were meeting students who wanted to be the next Damien Hurst or the next Tracy Emin. And we were, sort of, uh, we were sort of saying, well, when we went to art school, we sort of like thought we might get some recognition when we were 50. It wasn't, didn't have this pop mentality to it. Perfect timing. So we were, yeah, so I noticed that, <laughs> unfortunately. Pete got in a bit earlier. Um, and he's a month old, a couple of months older, I think. Um, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it was, um, we were definitely out of step, but that's because I think, I don't 
you know, we like some of the same painters and we like some of the same music. And Pete was the only person I got on without within St. Martin's. But I think a lot of it is the uh, fact that Pete's serious and I'm serious. You know, we sort of like me, you know, we meant it and we were really actually love painting. So our big problem was we're actually interested in what we did. <laughs> Does that sound sarcastic? Good. But suggest that everybody else wasn't. Well, it did, yeah, I know, yeah, it does have that <laughs> feeling. Well, the thing is, you see, I think that a lot of things are product placement and they're pitched. And you see, if you're doing something that you really mean, then you, you, it's almost beyond you to sort of pitch it as a uh, product. And I think that a lot, of, um, a lot of art has always been, and especially fashion art, has been product placement because it's a good way of making money and fooling the people. It doesn't mean that some of the people haven't got some talent at doing that. I mean, this is almost what my father's job was as a graphic designer. Um. We got a big yay on that or a no? Or? <laughs> oh, show of hands. Yeah. Um, I came in on the train from uh, uh, Heathrow last night uh, with Jeremy Dallard, who just happened to be on the same plane as me. And they give you an evening standard just before you come through customs now, just before you show your passport, which I thought was an interesting marketing thing I've never seen before. They wouldn't give you the New York Post before you arrive in New York as your passport to London. But um, we're not going to talk about Tracy. But Tracy was in the evening standard twice last night. And then I was given it again tonight when I was uh, heading back to my sister's house. And oh, she's in it again tonight. So it was, it was remarkable. Um, persistence. Uh, of something. <laughs> but I asked, uh, Peter Doig lives in Trinidad um, now, and uh, I, he was in New York last week when he was show up, and uh, at White Columns, we released a new record by uh, Billy and his new group, the Musicians of the British Empire, and Peter Doig painted the sleeve, so this is, this is the record. That's uh, Peter Doig's sleeve, and Peter did the inside too. Um, but um, I asked Peter if he had any questions for you, so I emailed some questions in, oh, I think. You I've, should, yeah, take notes here. You can nick these. <laughs> but um, I've been to talks where people are Skyped in and so forth, but it's not going to be that. But um, here's a question for you, which is... Um, I'll have that after. It's just an email printed out. Yeah, I know. Um, Nielsen's going to nick it. Peter's question is, uh, you know, after many years of protest, um, albeit sometimes with your tongue in cheek, about not being shown as a painter. Uh, he says, you now have prominent shows in both London and New York, so how does that feel? Um, it, feels, it feels about time. <laughs> and I beyond that, how does it feel? Um, uh, not that different, really. It's, um, it's always nice to be included, to be invited to the party, you know? But... How does it feel? Hold on a second. It feels quite nice. You know, it's like nice to be recognised for um, what you do. Because I've always been interested in being recognised. That's another reason I paint and write. It's because I want people, people to um, see me so that I feel more real and, uh, and less like I'm... Uh, about to check out, it's like how to be here and how to be seen for who you are and how you are rather than just projection. Of course, the problem with doing things in public is that you pick up lots of extra projections and you have to keep your, uh, you have to keep your sanity within that. But it's like... Um, it's, I was asked to be on Celebrity Big Brother about six years ago or so, and I wouldn't do that because, you see, you're not, it's not about anything. You'd never seen the show, though, had you? No. But it's not about any. I, my friends told me about it, but it's not about anything. Whereas recognition for what you do is quite nice. And I, I suppose that's where it's quite good for like, someone like Pete, who's not had to, had to deal with the fact of being a bloody musician. He had the sense not to learn to play guitar. Um, one of the things you know... <laughs> when I've been... One thing, you know, in the, the, the show that me and Richard put together for the ICA, I mean, my goal for it was to present what you're doing now, which is the 
the paintings that are downstairs. Um, but it seemed like we had this extraordinary opportunity to, to contextualize that with, uh, you know, 30 years plus of writing and 30 years plus of music. Um, and it was interesting just going to the upstairs galleries with John Sezica today because those galleries are, you know, quite formal and quite beautiful. And, uh, you know, I like how these spaces that, you know, would lend themselves very well to the paintings have these other kind of histories, this other kind of narrative without the show feeling like a retrospective. Um, you know, the goal was to make the exhibition feel, you know, very much present tense. Um, you know, one thing I think that we, you know, we, we didn't avoid it or, you know, completely uh, censor in a way, if that's the right word, but it, it alludes to something Peter meant, which is the word of years of protest. And um, I've never really talked to you about it since the time, but I was curious for you know, to talk about your involvement with the Stuckists, because it's something that persists in any kind of subsequent press that relates to your work. But certainly, as I understand it, you're only involved formally with the Stuckists for a year, but Certainly when it began, and to stuck us was you, Charles Thompson, and some other people, um, mm -hmm. it seemed not uninteresting to me. I mean, it seemed like a, an interesting idea to set up something that was oppositional or in relation to something else. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, looking back, because it's a long time ago now, and certainly I feel like its, it's, it's shadow has faded many years ago, but sometimes you read in the press, you wouldn't think that. Sometimes, you know, press people think you're involved for years and years and years. But just thinking back, I mean, what was your understanding of the Stuckists and why it happened? And, and you know, I'm also curious, you know, did you, do you feel it had any, did it achieve anything? Um, well, that's the origin of the Stuckists, yeah. Well, the Stuckists, really, their origin is in 1970s in the Midway Poets, which were, well, this is where I knew these people from. You know, were painters and writers and we were on TV and did stuff. And um, there is a really, really simple reason why the Stuckists exist, which it never gets talked about. Charles Thompson read an interview with Tracy in the newspaper and thought, I'll go along and see old Tracy, the old mucker, because she used to go around and complain about what an arsehole I was to him when we were boyfriend and girlfriend, because Charlie lived next to Maidstone Art School. So Charlie went round to Tracy's museum and went in. And Tracy can be very charming and very friendly and she can be busy. And she was being busy. <laughs> and if she'd have made Charlie a cup of tea, he would never have thought of making it starting the Stuckers. <laughs> so it just shows it's always a good idea to make someone a cup of tea. And I had this group, an art group, which was already in, supposedly in, in opposition of this uh, conceptual work, which I didn't like, I called Banker's Dada. And that was, it was called the Group Hangman. And Group Hangman had its origins in the early 80s, and it was actually Tracy's idea, it was her and two former girlfriends of mine. And it was a print group. And I got Group Hangman still going in the uh, 90s and decided to make it an anti conceptual group. And Charlie said to me, do you want to form a group called the Stuckies? It's based on this poem when Tracy had a go at you 10 years back. And I said, yeah, if you want. And then we, he said, well, I've got an exhibition. And this is in 1990. And I said, okay. So I went along to the exhibition. I said, is it an, oh yeah. I said, if we've got a group, we should have manifestos. And I'd already been writing manifestos. And he said, okay. So I wrote a couple of manifestos with Charlie. And then he had this exhibition. I went along and saw all the art that was in it. And I said, this is what we've written about. <laughs> I said, um, I think I'm going to have to leave the group. And this is in about a couple of months after the formation of it. And uh, he said, well, is there any way you could stay on? And I said, well, I suppose mature people can be in a group with people they disagree with and work they don't like. And I'm trying to be mature, so I'll stay as long as I can. So I wrote a couple more manifestos and then left a year later. And as far as it went, I never went on any of the demonstrations because I thought they were rubbish. And I, I also had, uh, I was also very sick, so I didn't go. And um, I really liked the manifestos. And I, we wrote a let really great letter to um, Sir Nicholas Sorota, and we wrote a really good manifesto called Remodernism, 
And these, these manifestos took me and Charlie about 20 hours to write each one. And they're really Is that a long boiled time? down. And they're, really, they're very short, condensed <laughs> manifestos. Yeah, that is a long time. You know, 10-point manifesto. I should be able to knock that out over breakfast. <laughs> and, um, but that's Charlie for you. So um, I thought that it was really, really worth writing these manifestos. Other th and once that was done, I didn't see any um, value in being in the group whatsoever. And I didn't want to be exhibiting with the group, although I liked a couple of the painters. And I liked the... Uh, democracy of it and the fact that it's I always said to people well it's okay for people to disagree and it's okay for people to be incompetent because if we're going to get rid of people who disagree and people who are incompetent there won't be any of us left I mean uh, universally but you know it seems even from New York every time like this for example the Turner Prize rolls around they must have Charles on or the journalists at the Telegraph from the stand they must have Charles on speed dial because it's immediately mm. attached well, they used to get me, they ring me up and ask me about the Turner Prize. And I sort of say, well, I can write about it. I've never been to it. Um, and I'm not interested in it, but I can write something if you want. And I wrote something, and then people think I'm annoyed about it. Where I say, well, I've never ever been. I'm not annoyed about it. You ask me, if you ask me about anything, I'll tell you what I think of it. And I did actually say in the article I'd never been, but I didn't see that should uh, deny me having an opinion. <laughs> um. So, yeah, stuck is just sort of like pretty low on my list. But, you know, what I found interesting about it when you were doing it, because it, it occurred, a, a, you know, an interesting and, in, in hindsight, somewhat depressing time in British art, which uh, persists, or aspects of it persist, was that you resuscitated uh, a, a kind of polemical form, i.e. the manifesto, mm. that clearly, you know, had an established history and legacy here, going back to Wyndham Lewis, the water system, before that. But I think, you know, for me, that's, that language persists in your work and in fact if it hadn't been for the 20 hours you spent with Charles formulating those early manifestos it seems unlikely that your subsequent manifesto like work would have developed because in the corridor at the ICA we see some evidence no, of that that's not quite true well, because I wrote some manifestos for the for the hangman mm. group hangman and they are really really unreasonable and really sort of like quite problematic they make that, and this is the thing. I said to Charlie, I've written some manifestos. How about this? He said, My God, we can't, we can't say that. And that's why it took so long for Charles to take all the poetry and venom out of, my, my, out of the manifestos to make them slightly digestible. But yeah, I think working with Charlie helped me, um, helped me work out ways of, of phrasing some of the, the later pieces. Because that book there, published today, has got some really real strong art stuff and my fault has got a lot of um, stuff about art I mean if anyone bothers reading the novels it's got these conversations based on with my brother in the uh, in the early 90s with the Picasso Picasso show where I had a big argument with my brother where I said it was bloody autograph hunting because so much of it was rubbish you know without the autograph it was valueless and my brother's a big defender of art establishment and you know really very uh you know, he was a star student at Slade, a star student at the Royal College, and very, very ambitious. And we, you know, I had a, a lot of my um, polemic, polemic, is that the word? Polemic. Must have started from uh, having to argue, argue my position with my brother from when I was about 12, going along and seeing the Rothkos and telling him they were depressing rubbish. <laughs> and my brother, sort of like, if, if it was put in a gallery, it can't be that you don't like it. You know, so it started quite early on. I mean, I don't have any enemies or any problem. I mean, I, 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 mean, I don't like white wall galleries. I don't like establishment art places. But I pre there's a lot of other things I don't like that I live with. You know, I go to supermarkets and things. It's sort of like, and we, you know, I am able to um, negotiate the world and be within the world, which I disagree with. Disagree with the way we do many things. But I think the dialogue and opposition is essential to uh, intelligence. And for the, and to, tr when I was at, at the, uh, at St. Martin's, the tutor said to me that my, they asked me to talk about art in a certain way. And I said, I could do that, but I'm not going to insult you by doing it. You know, it's almost like, uh, it's respectful. It's respectful disobedience. 
uh, John Stezica told me at lunch that uh, Billy would come to uh, seminars and just try to disrupt them. Um, I think that was also a compliment from him as well. It wasn't saying that that was a bad but John, thing. John, John, I think John's sort of like... Um, John's got sort of like uh, fanciful memories sometimes. <laughs> I remember him saying that he remembered me bringing Tracy into St. Martin's. I said, well, I wasn't going out of her, so I didn't. He sort of like likes to remember things that aren't <laughs> quiet, you know. He told, he, he's told me a few things I certainly don't remember. Um, that seems like a, a good point for a, a third song. Uh, then I have one more question from Trinidad, and then we'll open it up to the audience because we've reached yeah. an hour. But so, Billy. All right. So, I don't know. You know, maybe we should do... I've got... You make me... I don't know how many people have heard me sing. I've got You Make Me Die, which is... I'll Perfect. do that at the end, if you want. Let's, no, let's do that right now. I'll do... One to do John the Revelator or something. Oh, John the River right now. John the Revelator, which is a, 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 a must be a gospel. Well, tell me who's there riding John the Revelator? Who's there riding John the Revelator? Tell me who's there riding John the Revelator? Wrote the book of the seven seals. Christ came down in the cool of the day. And called Adam by his name. But he would not answer him. Because he's naked and ashamed. Now tell me who's that right? John the Revelator. Who's that right? And John the Revelator. Tell me who's that right? And John the Revelator wrote the book of the seven seals. Well Christ had twelve apostles. Three of them led the way. He said, wait here just one hour whilst I go yon and pray. Now tell me, who's that right? John the Revelator, who's that right? And John the Revelator, tell me, who's that right? And John the Revelator wrote the book of the seven seals. That Jesus arose one Sunday morn, Mary and Mark did see. He said, go meet my apostles down in Galilee. Now tell me, who's there right? John the Revelator, who's there right? And John the Revelator, tell me, who's there right? And John the Revelator wrote the book of the seven seals. So I'm just going to ask this uh, one question from Peter Doig, and then we'll open it up to the audience. I hope people have, uh, I'm sure people have lots of things to say. So in New York, um, you recently said to Peter that it had taken you 30 years to appreciate certain disco or dance music records. So <laughs> as this uh, same sort of time factor, 30 years, awakened to interest in any other areas that you once considered banal or of no interest, then... I'll only mention a contextual thing is that Billy's agreed and we've asked some interesting uh, DJs in New York to remix some oh, of Billy's songs for the first that's time. That's nothing to do with interest. No, no, no. That's not what I'm... That's just contextual. So anyhow, just, um, you know, are there other things you've come around to slowly? I mean, like you mentioned supermarkets, which I guess isn't on the list. Yeah, well, a lot of things, it's not a matter of coming around to. It's a matter of sort of like being able to tolerate them. Disco music is something that I'll never come around to and I don't tolerate. It's not that I don't dislike this. It's not that I dislike disco music. It's that I'm uh, directly opposed to it. Um, you know, like the Clash disappearing from their first album and turning into this disco group. It's sort of like a travesty. Um, so I can appreciate some disco music in the context that it's not as bad as some commercial music now because everything that we do is get, gets more and more geared up and more and more commercial and more and more pushed in that direction. So um, my appreciation... I think that I'm not really that much in opposition and I don't think that I've grown in appreciation. Sometimes I've acknowledged things that I liked from when I was younger. 30, 40 years ago, I didn't like the smell of rose, and now I can tolerate the smell of rose. 
I still have trouble with over-perfumed things. A lot of the way we live and the way we do things gives me the heebie-jeebies. So for me, it's, gr it's gritting my teeth and being with it and understanding that I am meant to be here and I have a job to do and things that are worth communicating regardless of how uncomfortable I find the way we live. I presume that the only way that I'd feel union with the earth and humanity is if we were not living in such a uh, disconnected way. So if we met someone from 20,000 years ago, they would be far more sophisticated than any of us here in their understanding and relationship to the world by being able to be there, being able to survive there and being able to understand their position or not even needing to understand their position, not trying to find a, a way of negotiating, a way of actually being. And my interest in spiritual pursuits and painting is of how to be here and feel as comfortable as I can and as authentic as I can and as real as I can so that when I'm your friend and when I talk to you, you get as much of me as I can give you. And when I paint a picture, I give as much of me as I can. And when I make my friends who are here, they know that the thing that matters to me is us feeling all right together. And that's the purpose of, um, for me, that's the purpose and usefulness of art. Uh, I don't include disco music in that. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's strange that that is the purpose of disco, about communal, us feeling good together. Uh, Anyhow. I see. Well, you, I, you, you're not a disco it's man. enough of you. Um, do you have questions from the audience? Right on the front. Thank you both very much. Billy, can I ask you, you say that the Clash made disco music after their first album, yet Thatch of Children is a great honouring of London Calling. Can you let us know a little bit of your feelings about the Clash summer being very sincere protest singers, singers <coughs> musicians, folk musicians, and then becoming very successful and how that problem of success mm. relates to protest in relation to you here at the ICA. And as Matthew said, big show here, big show in uh, White Collins. Yeah, well, I, um, I think that... I can understand why Joe was so uncomfortable in the success that he had, but he was younger and he wanted the success and then he didn't, and then it was uncomfortable to achieve that. And also, they, like Joe had, you know, one of the worst things about The Clash was the protest element of it. I like them because they're a rock and roll group. And, I mean, London Calling is a great sort of um, moment after, you know, a high point in the low point of their later career, I think. But um, for me, I think that um, Joe reached a level of maturity by the end of his life in, in, in certain understandings, although I don't think that he had great taste in music or was getting that right, but he sort of like came into himself and was a lot less um, uh, caustic. And um, I really think that that shows that he went on a, on a journey that in the end was worthwhile, probably not through f probably the big drop after the clash. And, you know, and I'm sure that he would recognise that the clash lost their way in many ways as, as a lot of the group, you know, top ahead and then those others in the group did. I'm hoping that when I do my work, you see, some people have said to me, they've looked at the exhibition, and they say, well, there's nothing there of you, and where is it? You know, people who know my work at the ICA, and they've seen this. They say, but you know, it's, it just hasn't got that. And I said, well, they're trying to translate me. I said, but I've not painted pictures for the ICA, you know. These are paintings that I do from three years' period, and they're specific groups. And this is how they want to show how to, how 
to let people approach a very, very complicated uh, schizophrenic <laughs> individual and sort of gain some uh, value from it. Now, if I was sort of like pitching disco songs for it or changing what I did for it, then I would feel it would be very, very uncomfortable for me. And actually, with this conversation of the ones who are going to do, the reason that we've got these people doing these remixes in New York, they were teasing me about my attitude to uh, music and people covering what I've done. And I wanted Beck to cover stuff, and I wanted um, Kurt Cobain to cover stuff, and um, there's numerous other people. I mean, Kylie used a title for one of her albums, and if Kylie wanted to do one of my songs, no problem whatsoever, because I don't mind other people doing the shit version. You can uh, also collect the royalties. That is, that is actually even more important, because the other thing that's very strange of me is I really, really love money. <laughs> and I'm really into money, and everyone thinks I'm this great principled person. I am principled in the sense that I won't get out of bed or put any effort into doing anything that I don't want to do to get it. I'm one of these people, Robert Walser um, mentions, in one of his stories, he mentions uh, a person, I'm not sure he's talking about himself, who walks along the road expect expecting uh, cooked pigeons to fly into his mouth. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's me. Um, you see, I want, I want everything to happen with luck and grace. Is that, I like the cooked pigeons as a segue into another question. Is there um, another question in the room? Over on the right. I'm, I'm quite a bit older than you, I think about 13, 14 years. But I grew up in Dover. And uh, as I've been watching you, it's the first time I've seen you live. Um, I, I've been thinking about Madrid and the uh, arrogant front of the Spanish Civil War. All right. Um, <clears throat> and the great thing in my life growing up in Dover, was that kind of sense of the aftermath of the Second World War. Yeah. And it's very difficult to kind of think of anything without sort of thinking, what would have happened if? Yeah. Uh, and I just wonder, your physical presence, and your sense of style, uh, and the kind of moral issues that you've kind of touched on with your very personal kind, whether you also had a sense growing up in that part of southeast Kent of this aftermath of the Second World War, you know, the territory through which everything passed. Um, I would... Uh, my, my son's uh, great-grandfather fought in Spain in, in the International Brigade, um, not part of my family, but my son's great-grandfather, and he was head of uh, West Flanders Resistance as well during the Second World War. And um, my grandfather was fought at Jutland in the Royal Navy, ran away to sea at 14. And my rest of my family are Royal Navy and Dockyard from Chatham. And we were brought up basically indoctrinated with the Second World War non-stop when we were kids. It was every, everything that we saw and we understood. And I find it really really strange, sort of like with this, you know, I always thought that punk rock was the end of that, of the Second World War generation, or even of the Great War, with all of our grandfathers who were brought up with a, a really, really strong sense of the Great War with all our grandfathers, and then the Second War, the Second War, and we spent a lot of, the first pit drawings I did and the first pamphlets I made were about the fortifications around, around um, Medway, and I, did a, I attended my son's great-grandmother's uh, funeral. They're all communists out of um, Flanders, which is unusual because they're obviously it's Roman Catholic. And uh, <laughs> there were a few comments about the way I dressed. I think I was wearing this beret when I was at the, at the funeral. And she was a very highly decorated resistance fighter who'd given away all her children because they were going to be... Uh, she was going to be beheaded because her job was smuggling... Uh, dynamite on the explosives on the on the trains on the caboose with the German officers and she used to ride with the German officers because they'd help her on and she wouldn't get her bag searched but the girl before her had been captured and beheaded by the Gestapo and yesterday my son was talking to me about um, I had to pick, I, for this new book we've done, I just done a drawing of Hitler with a cat 
And Hadi said, can I burn the picture of Hitler with a can? And he was, uh, and he, well, first off, he asked if he could have it. And I said, I'm not sure your mother would like it. And I said, see, because there are other parts of the family who are Jewish and all wiped out in, um, uh, one whole section of his family were wiped out in Auschwitz. So, in a way, you see, it, it remains with us so strongly. And I do think that um, the Second World War is really part two of the Great War. And I think that the, this great interest that there's been in the Great War in the, in the country is because this, uh, this huge psychological scar of all of, the, of that war and what it did to this country and what the Second World War subsequently did is really, really uh, a really powerful presence in, the sh in, in, in our unconscious, which wishes to become conscious and be integrated. There's a huge amount of suffering. I mean, people were still in mad houses committing suicide from the Great War after the Second World War. I mean, the alcoholism that ran through so many families, the absent fathers, and how we sort of like, uh, which all originate, obviously, even more so from the uh, Industrial Revolution and everyone being stripped out of, the, uh, out of their communities and going into the cities, and people not having fathers. And I think this is a massive, massive issue. And the reason that our society is as scarred and messed up as it is, and so alcohol-ridden, and so damaged. So um, I think we're all living it. But it's also true, I think, you know, the, your current band, the, the musicians of the British Empire, you know, you wear military garb, but it, it doesn't feel like Carnaby Street and Swinging London. It feels like something completely different. Yeah, it's, um, it's honouring... It's honouring ghosts and damage. And I mean, a lot of work, people think this is dirty work and it sh uh, may be slightly morbid and shouldn't be gone into, you know, but like uh, a lot of this shadow stuff, which does, isn't really that present in the paintings downstairs, but, you know, this, uh, this broken, broken psyche that we all have, this thing where we, you know, we've had thousands and thousands of years of karmic accumulation, which uh, means that we're all really, really pretty fucked up. And we need to sort of work on ourselves and work on each other and help each other. And uh, art can be a great thing for that, or it can be something which is used as another escapism, another pop music or another disco, you know. What we really need is to, like, to be very serious about these things with a good sense of humour involved. I think on that I'm going to invite Billy to sing the last song, and then we'll continue this conversation downstairs in the bar. So Billy will close the proceedings. I'd like to thank you all again for coming and for your patience. Um, I'd like to thank Richard and Mark again for the invitation to be able to do this at the ICA, and uh, we'll leave Billy with the last word. All right. This is a uh, song from 1990... no, 1986, and it's called uh, You Make Me Die. Well, there's a feeling in this world that causes unrest. Your ambition and success is what I detest. I try to be true. I'm trying my best. I'm not seduced by your cheap love. Hatred's a mess. Oh, you made me die. I heard all you gotta say, I heard it in school About your soft, soft sex and your sickly drool You only care for yourself, you're like all the rest You love your filthy God and think you're the best Whoa, you made me die TVs, videos, money and vice or get you crawling on the floor like a sucking lice. You'll swallow seed before you'll take advice. Well, someone should have told you, go. that ain't very nice. Whoa, you made me die. Whoa, you made me die.
Thanks, everybody, and the bar is open downstairs, so hopefully we'll see some of you there. Okay. I do have that one. <coughs>